Hey guys, and welcome to our long overdue final video in the series where we will be implementing the convergence check for our semi newly created multi objective GA. A few quick disclaimers as always before we start, the approach that we are going to go through here today will work with any number of objectives, but performance will degrade as you add many, many more objectives. And as a rule of thumb, if you're looking to have any more than three objectives, you should probably be considering NSGA3 rather than NSGA2, which is what we're implementing here. As always, this won't be written in the most optimal way. Speed really isn't our concern here, but hopefully it is all clear and makes sense. So a quick recap before we dive in. In the last video, we implemented the multi-objective component of our GA. We implemented a method of visualizing the results where each objective was given its own axis like so. Solutions were then plotted based on their fitness in each objective. We also covered the Pareto optimal front that these results trend towards over time. And I also drew the arc to represent this front. Within the front, individuals that are further from one another are considered fitter as we want to promote diversity in our population. If we let our GA run, over time, this bias causes individuals to evenly spread out over the Pareto front to maximize coverage of the solution space while improving fitness. This means that after a number of generations pass, your population should look something like this, where the individuals are approximately evenly spaced over the Pareto front. Knowing this, I'm sure most of you watching this have a few ideas of how we could check for convergence. The first thing that might pop to mind is to wait until all individuals in the population fall within the first Pareto optimal front. However, the problem that you're trying to solve might not have enough unique solutions in the Pareto optimal front to allow this. So using this metric, it's possible that for some problems, including the one that we're going to go through today, would never converge or we would have to manually stop it. We could attempt to improve on this. For instance, say that if a large number of generations pass and the number of individuals in the first Pareto front hasn't changed, then improvements are no longer being made and we've converged. But consider the case where all of our individuals quickly fall onto our first front as you see here. Well, this solution isn't very good at all because our individuals are all bunched up. Now over time, it's possible that they'll spread out to cover more of the solution space, but our new metric can't account for this. And furthermore, the entire front might be moving towards the lower left-hand corner, becoming fitter, even if the number of individuals in the front itself isn't changing. Well, in this case, what we really need is a way to track this arc. And when it stops moving towards the lower left, and a sufficient number of generations have passed, we could safely say that the solution is no longer improving and has likely converged. The first thing that pops into my head would be to find some way to represent the line that the Pareto individuals make and track its movement over time. So you can probably think of a couple of ways that we could do this. One way might be to track the position of every individual in the population from one generation to another and we could check the positions over time, calculate the delta in the position between generations, and maybe compare it to some threshold. But offspring in the population may have similar positions to one or both of their parents. So how would we track the movement of a new child individual? Well, we could do something like take the position of both parents and average them together or something, I don't know. Things get extremely ugly very quickly, and we would have to write a lot more code to handle it, and it would likely be filled with logic holes because I'm the one that's writing it, and that's how things seem to go. So let's just take a small step back and ask ourselves, what are we really saying is happening as the arc moves towards the lower left? Another way of looking at it could be to say that the area under the Pareto optimal curve is getting smaller as each improvement we'll move our individuals towards the origin. Well, that's great. Area under the curve is something that isn't too difficult to calculate. Uh, if you know the equation of the line, which we don't. Now, when I was at university, before we learned about integrals, we learned about this thing called Riemann sums. 
Now, if this doesn't sound familiar, either get ready for a 66 second crash course, or feel free to let your eyes glaze over. So Riemann sums are a method of calculating the area under a curve. The calculation works by taking an arc and sampling it at various points. If we start with a single sample point like so, we will get a pretty average estimate of the space under the curve. If we sample with two points, we'll get a little better result. And as we add more and more sampling points, we get closer to our integral and in turn the actual area under the curve. The cool thing about this is our sample points don't have to be evenly distributed. Of course, it's better if they are, but as long as the individuals are spreading out over the front, the estimate will improve. One thing that you might have noticed is that the height of each of these segments is set to the height of the arc at the center of the segment. While this is one approach, the same thing can be done with the top left or the top right. Using the midpoint will usually give the most correct values for area. However, fortunately for us, we don't need the area to be too accurate. Rather, we just need to measure the change over time. If you're interested in having a little mess around with this, I've left a link to the same integral approximation calculator that I've shown here down in the description. Go give it a look, throw some numbers at it if you feel like it. It is weirdly surprisingly fun. Welcome back to those who skipped over that section. Jumping back to our Pareto front, the fitness of our individuals gives us the sample points along the Pareto optimal line. Using what we've learned from our Riemann sums, we will use the sample point as the top right hand corner to each of our area calcs. The best part of this approach is that it can be used with any number of dimensions and is often referred to as hypervolume calculations for more than three objectives. The implementation that we're doing here today though will be locked to two objectives and that's because it's way easier to follow, let alone write. But if you're looking to improve speed or you want to know other improvements that can be made to this algorithm, try searching hypervolume or specifically the HSO algorithm. In this example, we will call each segment a slice. So let's walk through how this will work in our engine. We spawn our individuals, just like usual. We then start breeding. We select parents, produce offspring and cull the resulting population, all as we did before. Now after each generation, we split the first Pareto front up into these slices. The slice for the first individual is nice and simple because it is the rectangle from the origin, zero, zero. And then because our time objective is on our X axis and our distance objective is on our Y axis, the upper right hand corner of our slice would be at time fitness comma distance fitness and our first slice is complete. Then we need to calculate the same thing for our next individual. Here, things are a little more complicated, but not much. The slice still starts with a value of zero on the Y axis from the right of the previous slice. So that would just be the previous individual's time fitness comma zero. And just like our first individual, the top right hand corner would be time fitness comma distance fitness and we're done. This exact process can then be repeated for each of the remaining individuals and we are left with a set of slices. Then we can very simply sum the area for each of these slices and this is the new value that we can track between generations to determine if our population has stopped improving. Just as we did way back in the single objective days, our area is a single value and we can compare it to the previous generation's value plus some tolerance. So this is a surprisingly small amount of code. The first thing that we're going to do is write a new class called slice that will take in the lower left and upper right corner of our slice. And it will have a property on it called area that we can query later. So navigating to the data structures folder, we will right click and select add and class. And we're gonna call our new class slice. Now, rather than a class, we'll change this to be a public struct and we're going to add some properties to hold the corners of our slice. We'll start by creating a public float and we'll call it X lower. And this is going to be read only. So we will only create the getter for it. Then let's duplicate this line for our three other variables. And then let's rename them. So the first one will be Y lower and the next one will be X upper and lastly, we'll have Y upper. 
We will then add the area property to our struct. So we can do this by typing public float area, which will be a calculated property and that will be equal to the x upper minus the x lower, which is the width. And we will multiply the width by y upper minus y lower, which is the height. Then we need a constructor. So let's create one by highlighting the variables we want in the constructor and clicking the screwdriver and selecting create constructor. And that's it, our slice struct is done. Then we want to go back to our world class and jump down to line 20. As we talked about before, we are going to need to track our convergence area between generations. So let's create a private float and we're going to call it previous convergence area. And we will initialize it with a value of float dot max value. Then jumping down to line 90, the offspring have been added to our population and the population has just been culled. So we need to get the new area. We need to then compare it to our previous area. So let's create a new variable called current area and we'll set it to a value of zero F for now and we'll come back to it in a second. Because we're doing floating point comparisons, we really shouldn't compare two floats with equality. So we'll say if math.abs and you probably guessed this stands for absolute value. And then inside the brackets, we'll write the previous convergence area minus the current area is less than some tolerance, let's say 0.1. Well, then the two numbers are approximately the same. Therefore, our solution hasn't improved and we'll want to increment our no improvement counter. Else, well, this means that our solution has changed. So we should reset our no improvement count and we should update the previous convergence area to be our current area. Now that we have that out of the way, let's calculate the area of our new population. The first thing we want to do is grab the individuals from only our first front. So we can do this pretty easily using link by writing var first rank is equal to our population where the rank of our individual is equal to one. Then we want to order our individuals in ascending order on our time axis. So we can do this by typing dot order by and then pointing the delegate to our time fitness value. Now that we have our first rank ordered, we need to pass them to some method that will take them and calculate the area. Fortunately, we have a static helper class called multi-objective helper that is filled with lots of handy methods to do things like this for us. So let's remove that zero and write multi-objective helper dot calculate area. And we will pass in our first rank. Ah, right, yes, we haven't written this method yet. So let's click the little suggestion from Visual Studio and allow it to generate the method for us. We can now control click on the method to go to the definition. We can see that Visual Studio got things eh, mostly right. We're just returning an object, so we can change that to a float and get down to writing our method. So in my head, I kind of see this as a two-step process. The first step is creating all of the slices, and the second is summing the area of each of the slices and returning the combined area. So let's calculate the slices. We're going to split this into a new method, so we can just write var slices is equal to get slices and we will pass in the first rank. Then we can let Visual Studio create the method for us. And moving to that, we will just change the return type to be an I enumerable of slice. Now we need to keep track of the X value of our previous slice every time we're going through our loop. The simplest way I can think to do this is to create a new variable to hold our current or previous slice. And as we go through the loop, we will update it to reflect the last individual that we've added. To do this, let's type var previous slice, and it will be equal to a new slice. And just for the first time, we'll pass all zeros into the constructor. 
Then, we want to loop over every individual in our first rank. The logic here is quite straightforward. We are going to just update our individual and then yield return it. So we can do that by typing previous slice is equal to a new slice. And then the arguments in order are x lower, which will be the previous slice dot x upper, y lower, which will always be zero, x upper, which is the time fitness of our current individual, which is individual dot time fitness. And finally, y upper, which is the distance fitness of our current individual. So again, we can type individual dot distance fitness. Then we just need to yield return the updated previous slice. Going back to the calculate error method, we can once again use link to make light work of this. We can type return slices dot sum, and we need to tell it what to sum, and that is the area. Okay, so I think we're ready to go. So first we'll build, and then hitting run, and pressing the space bar, we can see that the individuals in our population all moving along. And after a couple of generations, our text at the top has gone green, and we can see that we have a result. So we've done it. We've gone all the way from our initial implementation with a single objective with no convergence checks, all the way through to our multi-objective implementation that has crossovers, mutation, and even convergence checks. So everyone, that is going to be all for this one today. And this will be the last video in the series. I have had a great time making them and thanks for sticking in there with me. Since the last video, I've been working on a few things that I'd love to share with you. See, I had this problem where I constantly worked on little games or projects that I feel no one is ever really going to play with, but I liked making them. And some of them are just proof of concept technologies or systems that I wanted to learn how to use. And I, I really like keeping a record of it, but it's not easy keeping track of so many old projects. And they mostly ended up sitting on some external hard drive in the back room somewhere, which is almost never plugged into my PC. I could move all of my projects to different Git repositories, but some of them really aren't deserving of their own repo, in my opinion. And even the projects within Reach, I rarely give them a thought or bother to open them up and run them, even if it might be something interesting for an hour here or there. So what I've done is to make an application that I'm calling the dashboard. It's effectively a program that acts similar to a retro game console selection screen that you see on a mini SNES or something of the sort. Every time I make an application now, I reference a shared library that I wrote and I create a class that implements my iApplication interface. I then write and build the application and dump the resulting DLL into the applications folder for my dashboard application. On startup, the dashboard will see this DLL, load the application inside it and show it ready to go. The interface is extremely simple to use and you can add your own simulations or games into it. It also comes with a few demonstration applications to show off some of the algorithms that we've covered in this series and some that we haven't. The self-driving code has been cleaned up a whole lot and is now available with menus that allow you to let the neural net auto train or for you to drive manually. And when you're in manual mode, the application is sampling your input and can be used to train your own neural network or act as a starting point for the computer to continue refinement. Now note that this is best done if you're playing with an Xbox controller because the analog input better describes the control that the AI has to the car rather than the discrete one zero that you get from a keyboard. Now the race one doesn't work, so let's just ignore that. But lastly, there's also a map maker that runs and is pretty fleshed out. You can draw lines, move vertices, set the starting point, make checkpoints, undo, redo, the whole shebang. There's also a small neural net demo that will guess handwritten digits. Uh, there's a maze generator and solver. And best of all, it is <laughs> freely available on my GitHub right here. Take a look down at the link in the description. Let me know what you think, and I will see you all in the next one.